Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Monday. It is so great to be with all of you. And today, well, as all of you here at Namaste Village know, it is, it feels like an ominous day, doesn't it? We, we wake up to rain and thunder and lightning, and it's perfect given the topic that, uh oh, the topic that I would like to share and discuss. And in fact, all last night, after I wrote a piece, I was thinking, is this too much? Am I going too far? Are they going to be able to relate to this? Are they ready? All of these questions are going through my mind. And of course, the answer is yes, of course, you are ready if you choose to be, if you choose to see, if you choose to know. Now, we can put off seeing, we can put off knowing for a very long time and spin in this world of, of imagined realities. We can spin here for generation after generation after generation, if that's what we choose. And there'll be a certain amount of satisfaction in that spinning. We'll, we'll feel like we're, we're solving the problems of the world, making the world a better place, even though the evidence doesn't really support that, does it? Even though when we look out at the, the, the world that we've created, it gets harder and harder to say, everything's gonna be just fine, don't worry. It seems like we just keep heading in the wrong direction and we never really turn back. We never turn back in the right direction. And that's why this lesson is gonna be uncompromising. That's why this lesson is going to be perhaps a shock to some of us. And if it is, that's okay. My only advice is just be present with it. Just take it in. And, and even if you feel major resistance, people keep getting unmuted. Here we go. Even if we feel, even if you feel major resistance to the essence of this, this lesson, that's okay. But just be willing to consider. That's all we can ask. So like I said, last night, I, I had this lesson that came to me and I, I typed it all out on my computer. I sent it to myself as an email so that I would be able to share it this morning. And, and I woke up this morning worried, I guess you could say, concerned that maybe I'm going too far with this one. Maybe this uncompromising attitude that I, that woke me up, I, I had a teacher, as did Lisa, I had a teacher that was so completely uncompromising, holding our feet to the fire in such a way that we could not get away. And it did its work. It's not necessarily comfortable, but it did its work. And so this morning, that, that was the concern are we ready for this? And of course, the answer is yes. So I, I sent um, it in an email to Calico. I guess for some reason, I wanted to have some kind of a uh, uh, support. That maybe she would say, you know what? I, I'd hold back on this one. That was definitely a possibility, but she didn't. I walked by her, her room with, with Carmelita. And she said, oh my God, I'm so excited. I'm so excited, you have to share this. I said, really, you sure? She said, absolutely. We talked about it for a little while and she said, I have to share it. So I'm going to, but I actually right before session, the reason I was a little bit late getting up here or down here rather for a session is because I, I thought, well, maybe I should start with a story to kind of ease into the uncompromising part of this lesson. And I remembered that there were many times and probably every true teacher 
In other words, every teacher that is walking the edge of transformation, calling us into the experience of wholeness, each and every single one of them at one point or another comes to the point where people will say to them, their students will say to them, oh, come on, it can't be that serious. <laughs> really? I mean, you're making me look at it to that degree? And the teacher will say yes and will allow those to walk away who aren't quite ready for the uncompromising nature of the highest teaching. I believe that you are all ready for the uncompromising nature of the highest teaching. You wouldn't be coming back here every day. You wouldn't be sitting here every day. So once again, listen deeply. And even if you do feel that energy of Really? Is that what really what you're trying to say? Just, that's okay. Take it in. See where it leaves you today. But I, as I said, I, I did write a little story right upstairs when I was getting ready to come down. And I didn't even have time to finish the story. So I'm going to read half of it. And then the other half, I'll just make up as I go. So the, the story is called, The Ship is Sinking. Okay. There was once, exactly, just like the Titanic. This is going to sound very familiar. There was once a great ship, and those who made the ship claimed that it was unsinkable. Every room and galley was filled for its maiden voyage. Such was the confidence in the great vessel. And there was a great and well-known teacher on this maiden voyage, who looked with suspicion upon the claims of the shipbuilders. All it will take is a single unseen slab of ice, and this ship will sink like lead, he said to them. And so it came to pass. And so it came to pass one night as people were partying, celebrating. The noise was so loud in the celebration that they didn't hear as the ship came crashing into an iceberg. And the party went on, even though the ship was beginning to shake and to rock. And all this time, this teacher sat passively, quietly, in the room watching this party. And as more and more people began to wonder, as the ship began to list back and forth, people began to wonder, what is happening? What is happening? Should we continue this great party and our confidence that this ship is unsinkable or should we consider something else? And they went to the teacher and they said to him, do you know anything? Can you tell us anything that's going on? And he looked very compassionately upon them and said simply, the ship is sinking. What do you mean the ship is sinking? That can't be right. I mean, maybe we're just you know, in the midst, middle of a storm or maybe a storm is approaching and it's making the water turn us in this direction and that. No, the ship is sinking. But they didn't want to listen. So they continued the celebration until little by little, one by one, they realized, indeed, the ship is sinking. That's the story. <laughs> now, we ask ourselves simply this. What does this mean? this listing back and forth, this, this feeling that there's something that's happening that we're never going to be able to correct, that we're heading in a direction where things are getting to the point in this world that we're never going to be able to correct. Of course, we all hold these visions that we're here doing this work to create peace on earth. We're here doing this work so that we can ultimately one day bring about a society and a world where peace prevails. That's a beautiful idea. 
the question is, is it true? Or is it possible? I'm not saying that this is the truth, but I'm, I'm just wondering if we can consider it the possibility that this world that we have created was not made to demonstrate oneness or peace, but was made to demonstrate that the peace of God is not in the physical world, that the peace of God is the ascension from the idea of limitation, the ideas of attack, the ideas of you name it. So this is once again where the uncompromising teaching comes in. And it reminds me of even many times in, in the Gospels when, when Jesus gave him a fastball right down the middle. And he would say something and they would say, whoa, hold on. Do you really mean that? He'd say quite literally, not those words, but basically he would say, yeah, I mean this quite literally. And what did they do? They would walk away. There were, there were times in the stories where hundreds, maybe even thousands of people said, that's too much. I'm not ready for that. Now, he could very easily have stopped them. All he would have had to say is, I was speaking in metaphors. I didn't mean this literally. And they would have said, oh, okay. Well, then we're, we're comfortable with metaphors. But when you're that direct, but he didn't say that, did he? He let them walk away because a whole mind has only one intention, and that is to tell the whole truth. A whole mind only tells the whole truth. So when I went to Calico's room this morning, I was going to send it to Vicky as well, but I didn't even get a chance. So Vicky's hearing this for the first time. I, I thought about it and I said, yes. I mean, it's not, this, this lesson is not to the point that you're just going to, you know, pack your bags and leave Namaste Village. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to go that far. But I do want you to consider this. And that's why when we wake up to this ominous thunder and, and lightning going on all around us this morning, I thought maybe this is perfect. As you can see, suddenly it stops. Because now it's time for the lesson. Are you ready? Ready. All right, it's right here in my phone. I'm going to go th through this very slowly. It's, it's not long, but it's a little bit longer than many of the lessons we've shared. But I, once again, just take this in. You don't need to agree with it. You don't need to do anything with it. Just take it in. Here we go. Your resolute intention to retain the projected self-identity you call you is what keeps you locked in this unbearable world. Ooh, hold on. Really? This unbearable world? But there's so many lovely things about this world. There's so many lovely places we can go to and visit and join in. But there are also many other situations, and I won't even talk about them because you know very well. So let me read that sentence one more time. Your resolute intention to retain the projected self-identity that you call you. I love that. The projected self-identity you call you. That's what keeps you locked in this unbearable world. Your only problem is that you've never allowed you've never allowed your situation to become completely totally unbearable. <laughs> only partially. Ooh, you've never allowed that your situation, what you're feeling to be completely unbearable. You only allow it to be partially unbearable. The instant you accept that the perceptual world you seem to live in is totally unbearable, you will, it, that, that will be the same instant that you break free into the light and the world you think you see the world you think you see will dissolve before your eyes. Until then, you'll fight on. Protecting what you believe has value. 
You believe that there are things in this world that are worth fighting for. And so you keep clinging to hope. Trust me, there's nothing here worth fighting for. And your decision to surrender totally, to surrender totally is the only thing that's required to close the curtain on the silly drama you call perception. The silly drama that you call the perceptual world. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Partiality has never given you what you really want, has it? Even in the world that you made up in your imagination to hide from reality. You've never made a total commitment to anything. This is what the perceptual mind is. It's partial about everything. It never gives itself wholly, completely. You've never made a total commitment to anything. And that's why you still find yourself here in perception. The instant you totally decide that you don't belong in an unreal world, will, you'll wake up in what? The real world. The instant you resolutely decide that you don't belong in an unreal world, you'll awaken in the real world. Remember, it has to be a total dedicated decision. No one reaches heaven through lukewarm desire. Here comes the thunder again. No one reaches heaven through lukewarm desire. The gates of heaven are open to anyone whose heart is on fire with love. When I say that heaven has to be the only thing you want, I mean that quite literally, the only thing you want. But here's your dilemma. You, we, I, all of us want to carve out one or two relationships that we think we might have to sacrifice if we make a total commitment to love. Maybe you believe that you'll lose your husband or your wife or your children if you give yourself totally to God. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this from people. Or maybe you believe that your grandchildren need you and you have to separate from your total commitment. You have to separate them from your total commitment. In other words, I'm totally committed, but there's always that but. What about this? This is where the ego always trips you up, always. The belief that accepting everything requires a sacrifice of something. Did you hear that? The ego's belief that accepting everything requires a sacrifice of something. This is what we have to look at clearly. The whole mind recognizes that nothing is lost when you make a total commitment to love. Nothing is lost when you make a total commitment to love. But here's the truth that you've been hoping to avoid. When you make a partial, here we go, when you make a partial commitment to anything, you lose everything. Including the relationships or the things that you're trying to hold on to. So there are two statements here that we, we, we have to really pay attention to. The first is the idea that accepting a sacrifice requires, a, excuse me, accepting everything requires a sacrifice of something. This is what the ego believes. And, but this is the answer from spirit. Making a partial commitment to anything, you lose something. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. When you make a partial commitment to anything, you lose everything. That's something. You lose everything when you only make a partial commitment. When your commitment is whole and complete and total, everything, everything is contained within that. This is the Holy Spirit's answer to the ego's supposed dilemma. You've, proves, you've proven this over and over in your life. But until now, you've been unwilling to look at it clearly. You lose everything you love at one point or another. But now the moment has arrived when a new decision can be made. 
a decision that was already made for you. A new decision can be made, a decision that was already made for you. And that's all your total commitment was for. To surrender to the one who makes that final step for and as you. I'll say it again. To surrender to the one who makes that final step for and as you. It wasn't a sacrifice at all. In fact, now you're able to see all the unnecessary sacrifices you made to avoid this decision. Luckily, you couldn't avoid it forever. And this turned out to be your greatest salvation, that you can't avoid the truth forever. You can put it off for a very long time, but you can't avoid the truth forever. So just take a moment and tune into what you're feeling. It's going to be one of three things. Either you weren't paying attention, so you didn't hear anything. <laughs> and that would be a decision. That would be a decision to avoid because the ego is very good at avoiding. Or another possibility is that you're pretty pissed off right now. And that would be okay. Because this is a hard lesson to look at. But there's one final possibility. That when you hear this, you start to feel something building inside you. It, there's an excitement. There's a joy. There's an energy of release. Where you feel, really? I've been, I've been feeling this. I've been noticing this. But I was afraid to consider it. It's so resolutely, so with, with no compromise. So whichever of those three things you're feeling is perfectly fine. I'm telling you that this is true. It's up to you to, to decide for yourself. All we know is that the truth is true. You can't, you can't avoid the truth forever. Love will win. Heaven is your only goal. And it is the final destination. Heaven being an experience of total oneness, a total alignment with the truth that is always true. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to make sure the volume is all turned up here. Because we've got some powerful people here that we want to hear from. I'm going to go to Vicky, and then I'm going to go to Lisa, and then I'm going to go to Calico. So let's start in Quincy, Massachusetts. <laughs> Quincy, morning, guys. Oh, my goodness. Oh, wow. Yeah, so. Wait a minute. Jody and the whole go. Oh, Bill, everybody's there. Holy oh, mackerel. Oh, Bill so free. Everybody's here. Oh, I have a feeling a wedding is coming up. Are you guys there for a wedding, perchance? Married. Oh, married. <laughs> married. We're married. We're together. Yeah. <laughs> she got the bouquet. We're good. He's gone. <laughs> the the bouquet. Bouquet. So, Vicki, okay. let's start with you. Well, I have to just repeat what my sister just said. It's the door to joy because every partial commitment we've ever had has been the denial of the whole of who we are. It's that simple. And when we finally say, so what? I'm not going to grab this little thing when that little thing just re represents the wholeness that I'm really looking for. Let me go for the wholeness right now. Let it go. Show me. So what? Here I am. Okay, Nicole. Nicole. Yeah, I just want to say, James, that was spot on. Thank you for always bringing just, you know, next level, uncompromising and you know, I was thinking, I actually wrote a blog that's coming out for the Teachers of God Foundation this week, and it was very similar to what you said, of how for 25 years with A Course in Miracles, I got stuck with, I am here only to be truly helpful, I'm here to be the light of the world, I'm, I'm being generous, I'm being, and I never questioned who the I was that was being those things. So I got trapped in the body identification. I loved how you started of like, 
that idea we're here to bring peace on earth what if we let go of that idea we let go of every idea of trying to make this a better place and and stand in the discomfort of that stand in the discomfort of trying to make your brother feel better or trying to make yourself feel better and so the last two three years for me have really been I'm not going to be helpful anymore I am what helpfulness is I'm not going to try to be happy anymore. I am what happiness is. I'm not going to try to encourage, inspire, uplift. And that was a hard, that was my whole identity, Lisa Natoli. And when I stood in the discomfort of it, I can actually feel it in my stomach right now. It's like this energy field where it's like, who am I if I'm not being somebody who's being helpful? And then the transformation occurs. Then it's just this, it's a happening. So, <laughs> does Bill want to say anything? Come on, Bill. You want to say anything? <laughs> uh, thanks, James. Good to see you. I, you are the master storyteller. <laughs> oh my God, I was on the edge of my seat. I know. I couldn't wait to hear what the lesson was <laughs> yeah. because of the way you prefaced it. Yeah. And the thing that I love about you, James, is you are uncomprom mm -hmm. uncompromising. You, you are the messenger. You're the Pied Piper, and you're the greatest storyteller I ever knew. But you, you're bringing the idea of the desire that we want above all else is to know the self, is to know I am that I am. I love your greatest, latest book, The Non-Dual Universe, because that's really the pointer to what you're, uh, what you're bringing this morning. And I want to thank you for that message, for this morning's message, but for all of you that are interested in the work that James has done, uh, go to Amazon, buy the the non-dual universe, yeah. and you'll really get an essence for, I think, the heart of this morning's message. And really a thing that speaks to me is identifying with the essence of what we are, which is always right here. Yes. It's always the presence of I am. It's the love that you are that is eternal, and it's never changed, and it always is. And it's that essence that we're pointing to, the, the thing that James, that you're pointing to this yeah. morning. And thank you for yeah. coming to Quincy, Massachusetts. <laughs> yeah. Amen. We sure love you here. So good to see all of you. Oh, my goodness. What a joy. By the way, congratulations to Rod and Jody. We've been... Rod and Jody are dear friends who have been here to Namaste before, and we just bless you in your new marriage and so grateful for you. And there's, there was something I was going to say, and did it slip my mind? Well, one thing I will say is that those of us watching here right now who had Chuck Anderson as our <laughs> awakener, this, there's nothing new to any of this. And we were literally slapped around until we got it. I mean, quite literally. And, and it did its work. It, it had its true effect. And, and I just want to qualify everything that, that we've said until now, because there will be those who, who will think that, you I mean, we're not supposed to be doing anything. There's no way this world is ever going to change. Here's the thing. When you change your mind, the world changes. When, when you step totally in to the reality of love and transformation, everything aligns with your decision. So we're not here to try and bring world peace by solving this situation or going over here and doing whatever it is we think we're doing. We're here simply to accept the full transformation of our mind into a state of wholeness and oneness and then to watch as the world meets that. Like you were saying, Lisa, you got to the point where you realized that you, you, were, you were lost in the idea of being truly helpful and you finally had to the, come to the, to the question of who is the I that is trying to be truly helpful? And it was only in letting go of that that guess what? You're truly helpful. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We have 
it's a miracle. I mean, that's why, that's why we call it that. It's a miracle. So we have to step into the miracle. Stop trying to do this on our own. The, even the thought, I am here to be truly helpful. Who? I don't understand that. Who? I, it's the I am that is here to be truly helpful, not the identity. So let's hear from Calico, because Calico was the one that I, I went to early this morning and said, am I absolutely crazy? Should I just skip this lesson or should I go for it? And she said, go for it. So Calico, we'd love to hear what you want to share. Thank you, James. I love this. You know, and I, it follows on this weekend. I found this documentary called A Glitch in the Matrix, and it's profound. And it really kind of coalesced with a lot of ideas that have been going on for me lately. And the, the big thing about it is there's a whole world outside, outside of A Course in Miracles, that has a particular belief system that the brain is just a computer, nothing else but a computer. Now, this is where it gets interesting because all the software is the I. I am this, I am that, I am this, I like that, I don't like that. All that's the software that we put into the mind that feeds the functioning of the computer. So this, this video is really about just all these people that believe we're living in a computer simulation. That's all it is. But we have strong beliefs attached to that computer simulation. And once you start peeling those, those applications out, like, you know, I am a doctor, I am a woman, I am straight, I am gay, I am fat, I am tall, whatever there is, take all those applications out and just put in the single focus of I am love. It's not even I am, love, 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 focus on love, love, love. And once that focus gets there, the whole world shifts. Everything shifts. There's nothing to fix in the world. And just a little story, I know we're running out of time here, but just a little story that I got some final clarity with for myself was, you know, at the time that I was diagnosed with cancer, I had a practice that was completely dedicated to healing cancer, completely. I was the raw vegan. I didn't drink, didn't smoke, didn't, you know, exercised all the time, did everything right. Ozone, you know, I did it all, stem cells. And then I get terminal cancer. Well, what the hell? Well, that was my split mind. So I definitely had A Course in Miracles in there. I wanna see everything through the eyes of God. But then I had this other big application of, I wanna fix cancer. And so what happens to someone that has an application that says, I wanna fix cancer? They're gonna get cancer. And that's the way this computer operates. We have to look at what is the software that we're putting in to the computer, which is just this mind, this brain. The mind is the eternal part, and that's where the applications live. So when you get that love, I only want to see love, I only want to experience love, no matter what is happening, no matter what is happening, that's what you're going to see. And this, the, I must say, this documentary did a beautiful job of showing a, a lot of people that I hold in high reverence for having intelligent minds. And I could see how they were still like Elon Musk, who I think is a brilliant man. The, the difference between Elon Musk and my mind right now is he's still trying to fix the world. He's tr still trying to save the world. It's like, give it up. It, the ship is sinking. It's like, get back into just love. Everything, no matter what it is, noises, circumstances, people, love them. And once you start really completing this, this programming, the whole world shifts, everything looks different. There are no problems. There's nothing that isn't bad. Even in this documentary, they had this one kid that you didn't know where he was going through the documentary, but at some point you thought, boy, this is pretty dark. And he was playing you know, a lot of video games, you know, kill him, kill him, kill him. And at some point he killed his parents. 
And he went through a trial and his attorney said, we can get you off on an insanity plea. And he got it. He said, I don't want to get off on the insanity plea. I killed my parents. I'll go to prison, do whatever time I need to do, because I'm clear that was my programming. You know, it's like, this is the level that we're taking this. It's extreme. It's extreme, but it's like, I feel like if a kid that kills his parents can have a complete shift around that, taking responsibility for it, seeing the error of his ways, then any of us can do anything. And it's just kind of like, take it on. Whatever it is that you strongly believe in, challenge it, challenge it every step of the way. Thank you so much, James. I just, I love where you're going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for giving me the advice to keep going this morning. <laughs> and there's there's one final thing that I want to say that, that you sparked, and that is that we are blessed by this biocomputer that we have been given, which is really nothing more than a lens, okay? We've been talking about lenses a lot lately. They have this lens now, this telescope that can look so, like, billions of of light years into the past, literally, at billions of light years away to see planets to, and even galaxies that probably don't even exist anymore because it took, you know, 20 billion years for the light to even get, you know, it's mind boggling when you think about that. But all this biocomputer is, is a lens and we can have it focused on the object or we can keep it like everything is included in, in a different way of focus, which is what another documentary that we talked about last week was showing. And that's the documentary, How to Change Your Mind, all about plant medicine and, one of the, and, and how they've been using neuroscience to examine what actually happens in the brain when one is say, um, using psilocybin uh, as an example. And what they've noticed is that the sense of self dissolves. The idea of I. The lens gets adjusted so that it's not I, but everything. So it, it's, it's showing up everywhere, whether it be on documentaries, whether it be in a morning session, whether it be something that you read, and all it's saying is the ship that you think that you were on is sinking, but there is a lifeboat right outside. And that lifeboat is love. It's that simple. Even if you don't believe a single word anyone said to hear today, just trust that love is the answer. It's the only answer. And if you throw everything out, stay with that. Okay. Sound good? Oh, Baraka, you had your hand up. You want to say something quick? Yeah, uh, the, the key word I'm getting from this is the word helpful. I am here to be truly helpful. I think we need to redefine what that helpful means. Helpful is not rearranging the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. Helpful is awakening and allowing the world to awaken and be by being the, that presence in this world to facilitate the idea and the action of being awake. Thank you. I like that. It's time to stop rearranging the, oh my God, look who's back. I'm, I'm sorry, you all can't see, but Azuri who's been gone for two weeks in Canada just walked in the room. Our great leader. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's time to stop shifting the chairs around on the Titanic, thinking that we're being helpful. The only way that we're gonna be helpful is to lower those life rafts called love and get on board. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna to do to close. We're going to share, uh, sometimes we use this as a, a morning affirmation but we're going to use this today to close our session because it is one of those totally uncompromising sections that says it all. So join me in saying this out loud. Ready? 
I am as God created me. If I remain as God created me, fear has no meaning, evil is not real, and misery and death do not exist. I am as God created me. Amen, 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 e punto. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, in Quincy and everywhere around the world. We love you so much. Thanks to all of you here at Namaste Village. So let's get on that life raft. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. Love. Thank you. Love you all. Bye now. Have a wonderful day.